The Snowball Earth hypothesis proposes that during one or more of Earth's icehouse climates, Earth's surface became entirely or nearly entirely frozen at least once, sometime earlier than 650 Maya million years ago. Proponents of the hypothesis argue that it best explains sedimentary deposits generally regarded as of glacial origin at tropical paleolatitudes and other enigmatic features in the geological record. Opponents of the hypothesis contest the implications of the geological evidence for global glaciation and the geophysical feasibility of an ice or slush-covered ocean and emphasize the difficulty of escaping an all-frozen condition. A number of unanswered questions remain, including whether the Earth was a full snowball, or a slushball with a thin equatorial band of open or seasonally open water the snowball earth episodes are proposed to have occurred before the sudden radiation of multicellular bioforms known as the cambrian explosion the most recent snowball episode may have triggered the evolution of multicellularity Another, much earlier and longer snowball episode, the Huronian glaciation, which would have occurred 2400 to 2100 MYA, may have been triggered by the first appearance of oxygen in the atmosphere, the great oxygenation event. Topic: History Topic. Evidence for ancient glaciation mounts Long before the idea of a global glaciation was established, a series of discoveries began to accumulate evidence for ancient Precambrian glaciations. The first of these discoveries was published in 1871 by J. Thompson who found ancient glacier reworked material in Isla, Scotland. Similar findings followed in Australia 1884 and India 1887. A fourth and very illustrative finding that came to be known as Reusch's Moraine was reported by Hans Reusch in northern Norway in 1891. Many other findings followed, but their understanding was hampered by the rejection of continental drift. <laughs> <laughs> Global glaciation proposed Sir Douglas Mawson (1882–1958), an Australian geologist and Antarctic explorer, spent much of his career studying the Neoproterozoic stratigraphy of South Australia, where he identified thick and extensive glacial sediments, and late in his career speculated about the possibility of global glaciation. Mawson's ideas of global glaciation however, were based on the mistaken assumption that the geographic position of Australia, and that of other continents where low-latitude glacial deposits are found, has remained constant through time. With the advancement of the continental drift hypothesis, and eventually plate tectonic theory, came an easier explanation for the glaciogenic sediments. They were deposited at a point in time when the continents were at higher latitudes. In 1964, the idea of global scale glaciation re emerged when W. Brian Harland published a paper in which he presented paleomagnetic data showing that glacial tillites in Svalbard and Greenland were deposited at tropical latitudes. 
from this paleomagnetic data, and the sedimentological evidence that the glacial sediments interrupt successions of rocks commonly associated with tropical to temperate latitudes, he argued for an ice age that was so extreme that it resulted in the deposition of marine glacial rocks in the tropics. In the 1960s, Mikhail Budiko, a Russian climatologist, developed a simple energy balance climate model to investigate the effect of ice cover on global climate. Using this model, Budiko found that if ice sheets advanced far enough out of the polar regions, a feedback loop ensued where the increased reflectiveness albedo of the ice led to further cooling and the formation of more ice, until the entire Earth was covered in ice and stabilized in a new ice-covered equilibrium, while Budiko's model showed that this ice albedo stability could have Happen, he concluded that it had in fact never happened, because his model offered no way to escape from such a feedback loop. In 1971, Aaron Fager, an American physicist, showed that a similar energy balance model predicted three stable global climates, one of which was Snowball Earth. This model introduced Edward Norton Lorenz's concept of intransitivity, indicating that there could be a major jump from one climate to another, including to Snowball Earth. The term, ''Snowball Earth'' was coined by Joseph Kirschwink in a short paper published in 1992 within a lengthy volume concerning the biology of the Proterozoic Aeon. The major contributions from this work were, 1, the recognition that the presence of banded iron formations is consistent with such a global glacial episode, and 2, the introduction of a mechanism by which to escape from a completely ice-covered Earth. Specifically, the accumulation of CO2 from volcanic outgassing leading to an ultra-greenhouse effect. Franklin Van Houten's discovery of a consistent geological pattern in which lake levels rose and fell is now known as the Van Houten cycle. His studies of phosphorus deposits and banded iron formations in sedimentary rocks made him an early adherent of the snowball earth. Hypothesis postulating that the planet's surface froze more than 650 million years ago. Interest in the notion of a snowball Earth increased dramatically after Paul F. Hoffman and his co workers applied Kirschwink's ideas to a succession of Neoproterozoic sedimentary rocks in Namibia and elaborated upon the hypothesis in the journal Science in 1998 by incorporating incorporating such observations as the occurrence of cap carbonates. In 2010, Francis MacDonald reported evidence that Rodinia was at equatorial latitude during the Cryogenian period with glacial ice at or below sea level, and that the associated Sturtian glaciation was global. Evidence The snowball earth hypothesis was originally devised to explain geological evidence for the apparent presence of glaciers at tropical latitudes. According to modeling, an ice albedo feedback would result in glacial ice rapidly advancing to the equator once the glaciers spread to within 25 degrees to 30 degrees of the equator. Therefore, the presence of glacial deposits within the tropics suggests global ice cover. Critical to an assessment of the validity of the theory, therefore, is an understanding of the reliability and significance of the evidence that led to the belief that ice ever reached the tropics. This evidence must prove two things. 
that a bed contains sedimentary structures that could have been created only by glacial activity that the bed lay within the tropics when it was deposited, during a period of global glaciation, it must also be demonstrated that glaciers were active at different global locations at the same time, and that no other deposits of the same age are in existence. This last point is very difficult to prove. Before the Ediacaran, the biostratigraphic markers usually used to correlate rocks are absent, therefore there is no way to prove that rocks in different places across the globe were deposited at precisely the same time. The best that can be done is to estimate the age of the rocks using radiometric methods, which are rarely accurate to better than a million years or so. The first two points are often the source of contention on a case to case basis. Many glacial features can also be created by non glacial means, and estimating the approximate latitudes of landmasses even as recently as 200 million years ago can be riddled with difficulties. <laughs> Paleomagnetism The snowball earth hypothesis was first posited to explain what were then considered to be glacial deposits near the equator. Since tectonic plates move slowly over time, ascertaining their position at a given point in Earth's long history is not easy. In addition to considerations of how the recognizable landmasses could have fit together, the latitude at which a rock was deposited can be constrained by paleomagnetism. When sedimentary rocks form, magnetic minerals within them tend to align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. Through the precise measurement of this paleomagnetism, it is possible to estimate the latitude, but not the longitude, where the rock matrix was formed. Paleomagnetic measurements have indicated that some sediments of glacial origin in the Neoproterozoic rock record were deposited within 10 degrees of the equator, although the accuracy of this reconstruction is in question. This paleomagnetic location of apparently glacial sediments such as dropstones has been taken to suggest that glaciers extended from land to sea level in tropical latitudes at the time the sediments were deposited. It is not clear whether this implies a global glaciation, or the existence of localized, possibly landlocked, glacial regimes. Others have even suggested that most data do not constrain any glacial deposits to within 25 degrees of the equator. Skeptics suggest that the paleomagnetic data could be corrupted if Earth's ancient magnetic field was substantially different from today's. Depending on the rate of cooling of Earth's core, it is possible that during the Proterozoic, the magnetic field did not approximate a simple dipolar distribution, with north and south magnetic poles roughly aligning with the planet's axis as they do today. Instead, a hotter core may have circulated more vigorously and given rise to four, eight or more poles. Paleomagnetic data would then have to be reinterpreted, as the sedimentary minerals could have aligned pointing to a west pole rather than the north pole. Alternatively, Earth's dipolar field could have been oriented such that the poles were close to the equator. 
This hypothesis has been posited to explain the extraordinarily rapid motion of the magnetic poles implied by the Ediacaran paleomagnetic record. The alleged motion of the North Pole would occur around the same time as the Gaskier's glaciation. Another weakness of reliance on paleomagnetic data is the difficulty in determining whether the magnetic signal recorded as original or whether it has been reset by later activity. For example, a mountain building orogeny releases hot water as a byproduct of metamorphic reactions, this water can circulate to rocks thousands of kilometers away and reset their magnetic signature. This makes the authenticity of rocks older than a few million years difficult to determine without painstaking mineralogical observations. Moreover, further evidence is accumulating that large-scale remagnetization events have taken place which may necessitate revision of the estimated positions of the paleomagnetic poles. There is currently only one deposit, the Elatina deposit of Australia, that was indubitably deposited at low latitudes, its depositional date is well constrained, and the signal is demonstrably original. Topic: Low latitude glacial deposits. Sedimentary rocks that are deposited by glaciers have distinctive features that enable their identification. Long before the advent of the snowball earth hypothesis, many Neoproterozoic sediments had been interpreted as having a glacial origin, including some apparently at tropical latitudes at the time of their deposition. However, it is worth remembering that many sedimentary features traditionally associated with glaciers can also be formed by other means. Thus the glacial origin of many of the key occurrences for Snowball Earth has been contested. As of 2007, there was only one, very reliable, still challenged, datum point identifying tropical tillites, which makes statements of equatorial ice cover somewhat presumptuous. However, evidence of sea level glaciation in the tropics during the Sturtian is accumulating. Evidence of possible glacial origin of sediment includes dropstones, stones dropped into marine sediments, which can be deposited by glaciers or other phenomena. Varves annual sediment layers in paraglacial lakes, which can form at higher temperatures. Glacial striations formed by embedded rocks scraped against bedrock. Similar striations are from time to time formed by mudflows or tectonic movements. Diamectites poorly sorted conglomerates. Originally described as glacial till, most were in fact formed by debris flows. Topic: <inaudible> Open water deposits. It appears that some deposits formed during the snowball period could only have formed in the presence of an active hydrological cycle. Bands of glacial deposits up to 5,500 meters thick, separated by small meters bands of non-glacial sediments, demonstrate that glaciers melted and reformed repeatedly for tens of millions of years. Solid oceans would not permit this scale of deposition. It is considered possible that ice streams such as seen in Antarctica today could have caused these sequences. 
Further, sedimentary features that could only form in open water for example, wave-formed ripples, far-traveled ice-rafted debris and indicators of photosynthetic activity can be found throughout sediments dating from the snowball earth periods. While these may represent oases of meltwater on a completely frozen Earth, computer modeling suggests that large areas of the ocean must have remained ice-free, arguing that a «hard» snowball is not plausible in terms of energy balance and general circulation models. <laughs> Carbon isotope ratios. There are two stable isotopes of carbon in seawater, carbon-12 and the rare carbon-13 which makes up about 1.109% of carbon atoms. Biochemical processes, of which photosynthesis is one, tend to preferentially incorporate the lighter 12C isotope. Thus ocean-dwelling photosynthesizers, both protists and algae, tend to be very slightly depleted in 13C, relative to the abundance found in the primary volcanic sources of Earth's carbon. Therefore, an ocean with photosynthetic life will have a lower 13C, 12C ratio within organic remains, and a higher ratio in corresponding ocean water. The organic component of the lithified sediments will remain very slightly, but measurably, depleted in 13C. During the proposed episode of Snowball Earth, there are rapid and extreme negative excursions in the ratio of 13C to 12C. Close analysis of the timing of 13C spikes in deposits across the globe allows the recognition of four, possibly five, glacial events in the late Neoproterozoic. Topic: Banded iron formations. Banded iron formations (BIF) are sedimentary rocks of layered iron oxide and iron poor chert. In the presence of oxygen, iron naturally rusts and becomes insoluble in water. The banded iron formations are commonly very old and their deposition is often related to the oxidation of the Earth's atmosphere during the Paleoproterozoic era, when dissolved iron in the ocean came in contact with photosynthetically produced oxygen and precipitated out as iron oxide. The bands were produced at the tipping point between an anoxic and an oxygenated ocean. Since today's atmosphere is oxygen-rich nearly 21% by volume and in contact with the oceans, it is not possible to accumulate enough iron oxide to deposit a banded formation. The only extensive iron formations that were deposited after the Paleoproterozoic after 1.8 billion years ago are associated with cryogenian glacial deposits. For such iron-rich rocks to be deposited there would have to be anoxia in the ocean, so that much dissolved iron as ferrous oxide, could accumulate before it met an oxidant that would precipitate it as ferric oxide. For the ocean to become anoxic it must have limited gas exchange with the oxygenated atmosphere. Proponents of the hypothesis argue that the reappearance of BIF in the sedimentary record is a result of limited oxygen levels in an ocean sealed by sea ice, while opponents suggest that the rarity of the BIF deposits may indicate that they formed in inland seas. 
Being isolated from the oceans, such lakes could have been stagnant and anoxic at depth, much like today's Black Sea. A sufficient input of iron could provide the necessary conditions for BIF formation. A further difficulty in suggesting that BIFs marked the end of the glaciation is that they are found interbedded with glacial sediments. BIFs are also strikingly absent during the Marinoan glaciation. Topic: <laughs> Cap carbonate rocks. Around the top of Neoproterozoic glacial deposits, there is commonly a sharp transition into a chemically precipitated sedimentary limestone or dolomite meters to tens of meters thick. These cap carbonates sometimes occur in sedimentary successions that have no other carbonate rocks, suggesting that their deposition is result of a profound aberration in ocean chemistry. These cap carbonates have unusual chemical composition, as well as strange sedimentary structures that are often interpreted as large ripples. The formation of such sedimentary rocks could be caused by a large influx of positively charged ions, as would be produced by rapid weathering during the extreme greenhouse following a snowball Earth event. The delta 13 C isotopic signature of the cap carbonates is near minus, consistent with the value of the mantle. Such a low value as usually, could be taken to signify an absence of life, since photosynthesis usually acts to raise the value. Alternatively, the release of methane deposits could have lowered it from a higher value, and counterbalance the effects of photosynthesis. The precise mechanism involved in the formation of cap carbonates is not clear, but the most cited explanation suggests that at the melting of a snowball earth, water would dissolve the abundant CO2 from the atmosphere to form carbonic acid, which would fall as acid rain. This would weather exposed silicate and carbonate rock including readily attacked glacial debris, releasing large amounts of calcium, which when washed into the ocean would form distinctively textured layers of carbonate sedimentary rock. Such an abiotic cap carbonate Sediment can be found on top of the glacial till that gave rise to the snowball earth hypothesis. However, there are some problems with the designation of a glacial origin to cap carbonates. Firstly, the high carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere would cause the oceans to become acidic, and dissolve any carbonates contained within starkly at odds with the deposition of cap carbonates. Further, the thickness of some cap carbonates is far above what could reasonably be produced in the relatively quick deglaciations. The cause is further weakened by the lack of cap carbonates above many sequences of clear glacial origin at a similar time and the occurrence of similar carbonates within the sequences of proposed glacial origin. An alternative mechanism, which may have produced the Duchantuo cap carbonate at least, is the rapid, widespread release of methane. This accounts for incredibly low as low as minus delta 13 C values as well as unusual sedimentary features which appear to have been formed by the flow of gas through the sediments. Topic: <laughs> Changing acidity Isotopes of the element boron suggest that the pH of the oceans dropped dramatically before and after the Marinoan glaciation. 
This may indicate a buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, some of which would dissolve into the oceans to form carbonic acid. Although the boron variations may be evidence of extreme climate change, they need not imply a global glaciation. Topic: <laughs> Space dust. Earth's surface is very depleted in the element iridium, which primarily resides in the Earth's core. The only significant source of the element at the surface is cosmic particles that reach Earth. During a snowball Earth, iridium would accumulate on the ice sheets, and when the ice melted the resulting layer of sediment would be rich in iridium. An iridium anomaly has been discovered at the base of the cap carbonate formations, and has been used to suggest that the glacial episode lasted for at least 3 million years, but this does not necessarily imply a global extent to the glaciation. Indeed, a similar anomaly could be explained by the impact of a large meteorite. Topic. Cyclic climate fluctuations Using the ratio of mobile cations to those that remain in soils during chemical weathering the chemical index of alteration, it has been shown that chemical weathering varied in a cyclic fashion within a glacial succession, increasing during interglacial periods and decreasing during cold and arid glacial periods. This pattern, if a true reflection of events, suggests that the Snowball Earths bore a stronger resemblance to Pleistocene Ice Age cycles than to a completely frozen Earth. In addition, glacial sediments of the Port Askeg Tillite Formation in Scotland clearly show interbedded cycles of glacial and shallow marine sediments. The significance of these deposits is highly reliant upon their dating. Glacial sediments are difficult to date, and the closest dated bed to the Portiscag group is 8 km stratigraphically above the beds of interest. Its dating to 600 ma means the beds can be tentatively correlated to the Sturtian glaciation, but they may represent the advance or retreat of a snowball earth. Topic. Mechanisms The initiation of a snowball earth event would involve some initial cooling mechanism, which would result in an increase in Earth's coverage of snow and ice. The increase in Earth's coverage of snow and ice would in turn increase Earth's albedo, which would result in positive feedback for cooling. If enough snow and ice accumulates, runaway cooling would result. This positive feedback is facilitated by an equatorial continental distribution, which would allow ice to accumulate in the regions closer to the equator, where solar radiation is most direct. Many possible triggering mechanisms could account for the beginning of a snowball Earth, such as the eruption of a supervolcano, a reduction in the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases such as methane and or carbon dioxide, changes in solar energy output, or perturbations of Earth's orbit. Regardless of the trigger, initial cooling results in an increase in the area of Earth's surface covered by ice and snow, and the additional ice and snow reflects more solar energy back to space, further cooling Earth and further increasing the area of Earth's surface covered by ice and snow. This positive feedback loop could eventually produce a frozen equator as cold as modern Antarctica. 
Global warming associated with large accumulations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over millions of years, emitted primarily by volcanic activity, is the proposed trigger for melting a snowball Earth. Due to positive feedback for melting, the eventual melting of the snow and ice covering most of Earth's surface would require as little as a millennium. Topic: Continental distribution. A tropical distribution of the continents is, perhaps counterintuitively, necessary to allow the initiation of a snowball Earth. Firstly, tropical continents are more reflective than open ocean, and so absorb less of the sun's heat. Most absorption of solar energy on Earth today occurs in tropical oceans. Further, tropical continents are subject to more rainfall, which leads to increased river discharge and erosion. When exposed to air, silicate rocks undergo weathering reactions which remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. These reactions proceed in the general form, rock forming mineral plus CO2 plus H2O cations plus bicarbonate plus silicon oxide. An example of such a reaction is the weathering of willastonite. Calcium metasilicate plus 2CO2 plus H2OCA2 plus plus silicon oxide plus 2HCO3 minus the released calcium cations react with the dissolved bicarbonate in the ocean to form calcium carbonate as a chemically precipitated sedimentary rock. This transfers carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, from the air into the geosphere, and, in steady state on geologic time scales, offsets the carbon dioxide emitted from volcanoes into the atmosphere. As of 2003, a precise continental distribution during the Neoproterozoic was difficult to establish because there were too few suitable sediments for analysis. Some reconstructions point towards polar continents which have been a feature of all other major glaciations, providing a point upon which ice can nucleate. Changes in ocean circulation patterns may then have provided the trigger of snowball Earth. Additional factors that may have contributed to the onset of the Neoproterozoic snowball include the introduction of atmospheric free oxygen, which may have reached sufficient quantities to react with methane in the atmosphere, oxidizing it to carbon dioxide, a much weaker greenhouse gas, and a young Younger thus fainter sun, which would have emitted 6% less radiation in the Neoproterozoic. Normally, as Earth gets colder due to natural climatic fluctuations and changes in incoming solar radiation, the cooling slows these weathering reactions. As a result, less carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere and Earth warms as this greenhouse gas accumulates. This negative feedback process limits the magnitude of cooling. During the Cryogenian period, however, Earth's continents were all at tropical latitudes, which made this moderating process less effective, as high weathering rates continued on land even as Earth cooled. This let ice advance beyond the polar regions. Once ice advanced to within 30 degrees of the equator, a positive feedback could ensue such that the increased reflectiveness albedo of the ice led to further cooling and the formation of more ice, until the whole Earth is ice-covered. Polar continents, due to low rates of evaporation, are too dry to allow substantial carbon deposition restricting the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide that can be removed from the carbon cycle. 
a gradual rise of the proportion of the isotope carbon-13 relative to carbon-12 in sediments pre-dating. Global glaciation indicates that CO2 drawdown before snowball Earths was a slow and continuous process. The start of snowball Earths are always marked by a sharp downturn in the delta 13 C value of sediments, a hallmark that may be attributed to a crash in biological productivity as a result of the cold temperatures and ice covered oceans. In January 2016, Gernon et al. proposed a «shallow ridge hypothesis» involving the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia, linking the eruption and rapid alteration of hyaloclastites along shallow ridges to massive increases in alkalinity in an ocean with thick ice cover. Gernon et al demonstrated that the increase in alkalinity over the course of glaciation is sufficient to explain the thickness of cap carbonates formed in the aftermath of snowball earth events. <laughs> During the frozen period Global temperature fell so low that the equator was as cold as modern-day Antarctica. This low temperature was maintained by the high albedo of the ice sheets, which reflected most incoming solar energy into space. A lack of heat-retaining clouds, caused by water vapor freezing out of the atmosphere, amplified this effect. Topic: Breaking out of global glaciation. The carbon dioxide levels necessary to unfreeze Earth have been estimated as being 350 times what they are today, about 13% of the atmosphere. Since the Earth was almost completely covered with ice, carbon dioxide could not be withdrawn from the atmosphere by release of alkaline metal ions weathering out of siliceous rocks. Over 4 to 30 million years, enough CO2 and methane, mainly emitted by volcanoes but also produced by microbes converting organic carbon trapped under the ice into the gas, would accumulate to finally cause enough greenhouse effect to make surface ice melt in the tropics until a band of permanently ice-free land and water developed, this would be darker than the ice, and thus absorb more energy from the sun initiating a positive feedback destabilization of substantial deposits of methane hydrates locked up in low latitude permafrost may also have acted as a trigger and or strong positive feedback for deglaciation and warming on the continents the melting of glaciers would release massive amounts of glacial deposit, which would erode and weather. The resulting sediments supplied to the ocean would be high in nutrients such as phosphorus, which combined with the abundance of CO2 would trigger a cyanobacteria population explosion, which would cause a relatively rapid reoxygenation of the atmosphere, which may have contributed to the rise of the Ediacaran biota and the subsequent Cambrian explosion. A higher oxygen concentration allowing large multicellular life forms to develop. Although the positive feedback loop would melt the ice in geological short order, perhaps less than 1,000 years, replenishment of atmospheric oxygen and depletion of the CO2 levels would take further millennia. 
It is possible that carbon dioxide levels fell enough for Earth to freeze again. This cycle may have repeated until the continents had drifted to more polar latitudes. More recent evidence suggests that with colder oceanic temperatures, the resulting higher ability of the oceans to dissolve gases led to the carbon content of seawater being more quickly oxidized to carbon dioxide. Dioxide. This leads directly to an increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide, enhanced greenhouse warming of Earth's surface, and the prevention of a total snowball state. During millions of years, cryokinite would have accumulated on and inside the ice. Psychrophilic microorganisms, volcanic ash and dust from ice-free locations would settle on ice covering several million square kilometers. Once the ice started to melt, these layers would become visible and coloring the icy surfaces dark helping to accelerate the process ultraviolet light from the sun would also produce hydrogen peroxide H2O2 when it hits water molecules normally hydrogen peroxide is broken down by sunlight but some would have been trapped inside the ice when the glaciers started to melt, it would have been released in both the ocean and the atmosphere, where it was split into water and oxygen molecules, leading to an increase in atmospheric oxygen. <laughs> Slushball Earth hypothesis While the presence of glaciers is not disputed, the idea that the entire planet was covered in ice is more contentious, leading some scientists to posit a slushball Earth, in which a band of ice free, or ice thin, waters remains around the equator, allowing for a continued hydrologic cycle. This hypothesis appeals to scientists who observe certain features of the sedimentary record that can only be formed under open water, or rapidly moving ice which would require somewhere ice free to move to. Recent research observed geochemical cyclicity in clastic rocks, showing that the snowball Periods were punctuated by warm spells, similar to ice age cycles in recent Earth history. Attempts to construct computer models of a snowball Earth have also struggled to accommodate global ice cover without fundamental changes in the laws and constants which govern the planet. A less extreme snowball Earth hypothesis involves continually evolving continental configurations and changes in ocean circulation. Synthesized evidence has produced models indicating a «slushball Earth» where the stratigraphic record does not permit postulating complete global glaciations. Kershevink's original hypothesis had recognized that warm tropical puddles would be expected to exist in a snowball Earth. The snowball Earth hypothesis does not explain the alternation of glacial and interglacial events, nor the oscillation of glacial sheet margins. Scientific dispute The argument against the hypothesis is evidence of fluctuation in ice cover and melting during «snowball earth» deposits. Evidence for such melting comes from evidence of glacial dropstones, geochemical evidence of climate cyclicity, and interbedded glacial and shallow marine sediments. Longer record from Oman, constrained to 13 degrees north, covers the period from 712 to 545 million years ago. A time span containing the Sturtian and Marinoan glaciations 
and shows both glacial and ice-free deposition. There have been difficulties in recreating a snowball Earth with global climate models. Simple GCMs with mixed layer oceans can be made to freeze to the equator. A more sophisticated model with a full dynamic ocean, though only a primitive sea ice model, failed to form sea ice to the equator. In addition, the levels of CO2 necessary to melt a global ice cover have been calculated to be 130,000 ppm, which is considered by to be unreasonably large. Strontium isotopic data have been found to be at odds with proposed snowball Earth models of silicate weathering shutdown during glaciation and rapid rates immediately post glaciation. Therefore, methane release from permafrost during marine transgression was proposed to be the source of the large measured carbon excursion in the time immediately after glaciation. Topic: <laughs> Zipper rift hypothesis. Nick Isles suggests that the Neoproterozoic snowball Earth was in fact no different from any other glaciation in Earth's history, and that efforts to find a single cause are likely to end in failure. The zipper rift hypothesis proposes two pulses of continental unzipping. First, the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia, forming the Proto-Pacific Ocean, then the splitting of the continent Baltica from Laurentia, forming the Proto-Atlantic—coincided with the glaciated periods. The associated tectonic uplift would form high plateaus, just as the East African Rift is responsible for high topography, this high ground could then host glaciers. Banded iron formations have been taken as unavoidable evidence for global ice cover, since they require dissolved iron ions and anoxic waters to form, however, the limited extent of the Neoproterozoic banded iron deposits means that they may not have formed in frozen oceans, but instead in inland seas. Such seas can experience a wide range of chemistries, high rates of evaporation could concentrate iron ions, and a periodic lack of circulation could allow anoxic bottom water to form. Continental rifting, with associated subsidence, tends to produce such landlocked water bodies. This rifting, and associated subsidence, would produce the space for the fast deposition of sediments, negating the need for an immense and rapid melting to raise the global sea levels. <laughs> High obliquity hypothesis A competing hypothesis to explain the presence of ice on the equatorial continents was that Earth's axial tilt was quite high, in the vicinity of 60 degrees, which would place Earth's land in high latitudes, although supporting evidence is scarce. A less extreme possibility would be that it was merely Earth's magnetic pole that wandered to this inclination, as the magnetic readings which suggested ice-filled continents depends on the magnetic and rotational poles being relatively similar. In either of these two situations, the freeze would be limited to relatively small areas, as is the case today. Severe changes to Earth's climate are not necessary. Topic: <laughs> Inertial interchange, true polar wander. 
The evidence for low-latitude glacial deposits during the supposed snowball Earth episodes has been reinterpreted via the concept of inertial interchange true polar wander this hypothesis, created to explain paleomagnetic data, suggests that Earth's axis of rotation shifted one or more times during the general time frame attributed to snowball Earth. This could feasibly produce the same distribution of glacial deposits without requiring any of them to have been deposited at equatorial latitude. While the physics behind the proposition is sound, the removal of one flawed data point from the original study rendered the application of the concept in these circumstances unwarranted. Several alternative explanations for the evidence have been proposed. Topic: <laughs> Survival of life through frozen periods. A tremendous glaciation would curtail photosynthetic life on Earth, thus depleting atmospheric oxygen, and thereby allowing non-oxidized iron-rich rocks to form. Detractors argue that this kind of glaciation would have made life extinct entirely. However, microfossils such as stromatolites and oncolites prove that, in shallow marine environments at least, life did not suffer any perturbation. Instead life developed a trophic complexity and survived the cold period unscathed. Proponents counter that it may have been possible for life to survive in these ways, in reservoirs of anaerobic and low oxygen life powered by chemicals in deep oceanic hydrothermal vents surviving in Earth's deep oceans and crust, but photosynthesis would not have been possible there. Under the ice layer, in chemolithotrophic mineral metabolizing ecosystems theoretically resembling those in existence in modern glacier beds, high alpine and arctic talus permafrost, and basal glacial ice. This is especially plausible in areas of volcanism or geothermal activity. In pockets of liquid water within and under the ice caps, similar to Lake Vostok in Antarctica. In theory, this system may resemble microbial communities living in the perennially frozen lakes of the Antarctic dry valleys. Photosynthesis can occur under ice up to 100 meters thick, and at the temperatures predicted by models equatorial sublimation would prevent equatorial ice thickness from exceeding 10 meters. As eggs and dormant cells and spores deep frozen into ice during the most severe phases of the frozen period, in small regions of open water in deep ocean regions preserving small quantities of life with access to light and CO2 for photosynthesizers not multicellular plants, which did not yet exist to generate traces of oxygen that were enough to sustain some oxygen-dependent organisms. This would happen even if the sea froze over completely, if small parts of the ice were thin enough to admit light. These small open water regions may have occurred in deep ocean regions far from the supercontinent Rodinia or its remnants as it broke apart and drifted on the tectonic plates. In layers of dirty ice, on top of the ice sheet covering shallow seas below. Animals and mud from the sea would be frozen into the base of the ice and gradually concentrate on the top as the ice above evaporates. Small ponds of water would teem with life thanks to the flow of nutrients through the ice. 
Such environments may have covered approximately 12% of the global surface area. In small oases of liquid water, as would be found near geothermal hotspots resembling Iceland today. In nunatic areas in the tropics, where daytime tropical sun or volcanic heat heated bare rock sheltered from cold wind and made small temporary melt pools, which would freeze at sunset, however, organisms and ecosystems, as far as it can be determined by the fossil record, do not appear to have undergone the significant change that would be expected by a mass extinction. With the advent of more precise dating, a phytoplankton extinction event which had been associated with snowball Earth was shown to precede glaciations by 16 million years. Even if life were to cling on in all the ecological refuges listed above, a whole Earth glaciation would result in a biota with a noticeably different diversity and composition. This change in diversity and composition has not yet been observed. In fact, the organisms which should be most susceptible to climatic variation emerge unscathed from the snowball earth. Topic: Implications. A snowball Earth has profound implications in the history of life on Earth. While many refugia have been postulated, global ice cover would certainly have ravaged ecosystems dependent on sunlight. Geochemical evidence from rocks associated with low-latitude glacial deposits have been interpreted to show a crash in oceanic life during the glacials. Because about half of the ocean's water was frozen solid as ice, the remaining water would be twice as salty as it is today, lowering its freezing point. When the ice sheet melted, it would cover the oceans with a layer of hot freshwater up to 2 km thick. Only after the hot surface water mixed with the colder and deeper saltwater did the sea return to a warmer and less salty state. The melting of the ice may have presented many new opportunities for diversification, and may indeed have driven the rapid evolution which took place at the end of the Cryogenian period. Effect on early evolution The Neoproterozoic was a time of remarkable diversification of multicellular organisms, including animals. Organism size and complexity increased considerably after the end of the snowball glaciations. This development of multicellular organisms may have been the result of increased evolutionary pressures resulting from multiple icehouse hothouse cycles. In this sense, snowball Earth episodes may have pumped evolution. Alternatively, fluctuating nutrient levels and rising oxygen may have played a part. Another major glacial episode may have ended just a few million years before the Cambrian explosion. Mechanistically, the effect of snowball Earth in particular the later glaciations on complex life is likely to have occurred through the process of kin selection. Organ scale differentiation, in particular the terminal irreversible differentiation present in animals, requires the individual cell and the genes contained within it to «sacrifice» their ability to reproduce, so that the colony is not disrupted. From the short-term perspective of the gene, more offspring will be gained by causing the cell in which it is contained to ignore any signals received from the colony, and to reproduce at the maximum rate, regardless of the implications for the wider group. 
Today, this incentive explains the formation of tumors in animals and plants. It has been argued that because Snowball Earth would undoubtedly have decimated the population size of any given species, the extremely small populations that resulted would all have been descended from a small number of individuals see founder effect, and consequently the average relatedness between any two individuals in this case individual cells would have been exceptionally high as a result of glaciations. Altruism is known to increase from rarity when relatedness R exceeds the ratio of the cost C to the altruist in this case, the cell giving up its own reproduction by differentiating, to the benefit B to the recipient of altruism the germ line of the colony, that reproduces as a result of the differentiation, i.e. R greater than C, B see Hamilton's rule. The evolutionary pressure of the high relatedness in the context of a post-glaciation population boom may have been sufficient to overcome the reproductive cost of forming a complex animal, for the first time in Earth's history. There is also a rival hypothesis which has been gaining currency in recent years, that early snowball Earths did not so much affect the evolution of life on Earth as result from it. In fact the two hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. The idea is that Earth's life forms affect the global carbon cycle and so major evolutionary events alter the carbon cycle, redistributing carbon within various reservoirs within the biosphere system and in the process temporarily lowering the atmospheric greenhouse carbon reservoir until the revised biosphere system settled into a new state. The Snowball I episode of the Huronian glaciation 2.4 to 2.1 billion years and Snowball II of the Precambrian's cryogenian between 580 to 850 million years and which itself had a number of distinct episodes are respectively thought to be caused by the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis and then the rise of more advanced multicellular animal life and life's colonization of the land. <laughs> effects on ocean circulation Global ice cover, if it existed, may—in concert with geothermal heating have led to a lively, well-mixed ocean with great vertical convective circulation. Occurrence and timing Neoproterozoic There were three or four significant ice ages during the late Neoproterozoic. Of these, the Marinoan was the most significant, and the Sturtian glaciations were also truly widespread. Even the leading snowball proponent Hoffman agrees that the 350,000-year-long Gaskiers glaciation did not lead to global glaciation, although it was probably as intense as the late Ordovician glaciation. The status of the Kaigas glaciation or cooling event is currently unclear, some scientists do not recognize it as a glacial, others suspect that it may reflect poorly dated strata of Sturtian association, and others believe it may indeed be a third ice age. It was certainly less significant than the Sturtian or Marinoan glaciations, and probably not global in extent. Emerging evidence suggests that the Earth underwent a number of glaciations during the Neoproterozoic, which would stand strongly at odds with the snowball hypothesis.
Topic: <laughs> Paleoproterozoic. The snowball earth hypothesis has been invoked to explain glacial deposits in the Huronian supergroup of Canada, though the paleomagnetic evidence that suggests ice sheets at low latitudes is contested. The glacial sediments of the Maganayan Formation of South Africa are slightly younger than the Huronian glacial deposits approximately 2.25 billion years old and were deposited at tropical latitudes. It has been proposed that rise of free oxygen that occurred during the Great Oxygenation event removed methane in the atmosphere through oxidation. As the Sun was notably weaker at the time, Earth's climate may have relied on methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, to maintain surface temperatures above freezing. In the absence of this methane greenhouse, temperatures plunged and a snowball event could have occurred. Ice Age. Before the theory of continental drift, glacial deposits in Carboniferous strata in tropical continents areas such as India and South America led to speculation that the Karoo Ice Age glaciation reached into the tropics. However, a continental reconstruction shows that ice was in fact constrained to the polar parts of the supercontinent Gondwana equals equals see also